Welcome back to this free training series on FEMA P154, Rapid Visual Screening of Buildings for Potential Seismic Hazard, brought to you by the Federal Emergency Management Agency's National Earthquake Technical Assistance Program. This module will go through wood and steel FEMA building types. You're watching the sixth of nine training videos outlined here. Module one was an introduction to FEMA P154. Module two went over earthquake hazard and seismic performance of buildings. Modules three and four went over the rapid visual screening or RVS process. Module five went over key building performance indicators. Module six, this, this module will go over FEMA building types, uh, wood and steel. Uh, module seven will go over concrete and masonry FEMA building types. Module eight will be a class exercise and module nine will be some concluding remarks. Thank you, Gigi. Welcome to module six. We're gonna get into the details of the 17 FEMA building types now. Um, we're gonna do in this module, we're gonna do a brief summary of the different FEMA building types. We'll talk specifically about wood building types and steel building types and manufactured housing. So successful evaluation or screening um, during RVS is really dependent on how well we can identify the FEMA building type. And all of the scores on the forms are based on the FEMA building types and their performance that we typically see. So it's really important to be able to identify the FEMA building type and to have a baseline understanding of what kind of typical earthquake damage we would expect from those FEMA building types. Um, there are 17 FEMA building types sorted by material and by um, the seismic force resisting system. So the first material is wood. There are three wood building types, light wood frame, single family residential construction, that's W1. Light wood frame, multifamily, multi-unit construction is W1A. And commercial or industrial wood frame construction, these are our W2 buildings. Wood buildings represent the largest number of buildings nationally. The next material is steel. There are five steel building types. Steel moment frame is S1. Steel brace frame is S2. Light frame um, metal buildings are S3. Steel frames with concrete shear walls are S4. And steel frames with unreinforced masonry infill walls are S5. And these are divided into separate building types because they all have different performance. Um, the next group of FEMA building types is concrete. The concrete building types are further divided into those that are constructed of cast in place concrete and those that are constructed of precast concrete. So the first three types listed are cast in place concrete. Concrete moment frames are C1. C2 is concrete shear wall building. C3 are concrete frames with unreinforced masonry infill. And the next two types are precast concrete. Tilt up concrete buildings are PC1 and precast concrete frame buildings are PC2. The final group of FEMA building types are those constructed of masonry. There's three types. There's reinforced masonry with flexible diaphragms, reinforced masonry with rigid diaphragms, these are RM2, and unreinforced masonry wall buildings, URMs. Um, and then the last category is the manufactured housing, MH, and this is new in the third edition of FEMA 154. All right, so we're gonna start looking at the FEMA building types in detail, and we're gonna start with the wood FEMA building types, W1, W1A, and W2. W1, so these are wood light frame buildings. They're generally single family houses that are one or two stories high. And they typically have repetitive vertical wall framing of wood studs and repetitive horizontal framing of wood floor joists or roof rafters. Um, we see the image on the right here of an exploded house. Um, we can see the roof framing and the wall framing. Um, they're often sheathed with um, straight sheathing. So that would look like just siding or plywood or stucco. Um, and then on the inside, they're sheathed with lath and plaster if it's an older building or chipboard or, or drywall for newer buildings. And um, when they're sheathed with stucco, it can sometimes be hard to tell whether they're concrete or concrete block buildings instead of wood. Um, but if you, if you knock on them and it sounds a little hollow, then that's a good indication that it's a wood building. 
Um, and if you're able to get inside or even into the crawl space underneath the building, um, we can see a lot of this wood framing. Um, that's a good place to actually see the structure. Um, so the typical deficiencies are the cripple walls at the base of the building, which we'll talk more about. Um, the chimney, which is a non-structural hazard, but is one of the most common failures in this type of building. And then porches and overhangs can be um, vulnerable. So this photo shows an example of a typical older one-story wood frame dwelling. Um, and you can see the steps in the front are an indication that the first floor of the house is raised off the ground, creating um, a cripple wall that supports the first floor. On the right and front sides of the house, there's wood siding on this cripple wall. So generally the floor of the building is a little bit higher up than the ground. So we walk upstairs to get into it. And usually this floor is supported on cripple walls. So these are walls around the perimeter of the house and they can be really vulnerable to earthquake shaking due to the lack of stiffness and strength of these walls. So they usually don't have any sheathing on the inside surface. And um, the interior walls, you know, your hallways and all the room dividers, they don't extend into the crawl space. So the exterior cripple wall provides the only lateral strength between the first floor and the ground, whereas up above that first floor, you have lots of walls. So we get this weak story sort of effect, and um, these cripple walls are very vulnerable to damage. So here we see a photo from the 1992 Cape Mendocino earthquake, and we see two of the typical failures associated with light wood frame buildings. Um, here we have a weak cripple wall that has failed, causing the first floor of the house to drop to the ground. And although the upper two stories appear relatively intact, serious damage can occur um, with this type of cripple wall failure. Um, any utility lines that are coming up into the house, especially like gas lines, they can fail and we could have fire hazards. Um, the other type of failure depicted in this picture is the separation of the roof from the front porch. So the front porch, you can see the outline of where it used to be, um, and it wasn't well attached to the actual building, and so it fell. And failures like this right outside exit ways are really dangerous because they could prevent people from being able to exit later, um, or if someone was below there when it, when it failed, they could have been injured. So now we get to the second type. This is building type W1A, multi-unit residence. Um, this building type is reflective of light wood frame, multi-unit, multi-story residential buildings. So these have plan areas on each floor greater than 3,000 square feet. Um, so, so bigger than the W1 building type. Um, these buildings often have parking on the first floor. So large openings for garages or sometimes for commercial space at that level. Um, these are often termed tuck under buildings because of the parking underneath the building. And that represents a soft story vertical irregularity, a pretty severe one. So um, these type of buildings have performed poorly in past earthquakes because of that. This photograph from the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake shows an example of a soft story um, apartment building in the Marina district that was damaged. The structure has completely collapsed onto the first floor garage area due to the soft story. Um, the first story had much less stiffness and strength than the upper floors, which caused the damage to be concentrated at the first story. The other type of wood frame building is the large frame building designated W2. This type of building is most often used for large industrial or commercial buildings. This type of building has several features that distinguish it from the light wood frame building. Usually floor area greater than 5,000 square feet, large open spaces on the interior. So imagine a house has, has walls at every hallway and every bedroom. These spaces have big open interior spaces. Um, and then heavy timber beams or trusses supporting long span um, roof. Here we see an image of the main structural elements of a W2 building. So the walls might be sheathed with plywood, stucco, or um, wood siding 
and the roof might be sheathed with plywood or wood planks. There could also be diagonal bracing in the walls using wood or steel braces. The construction is usually going to be visible um, in these buildings from an unfinished attic space of the building, or if it's used like um, as, as a storage area or a factory, oftentimes the framing will be visible through a window. Um, and oftentimes um, we might have commercial storefronts um, in these buildings that, that can lead to that type of vulnerabilities. But this, would, this building has a torsional irregularity because it has no walls on one side. This photograph shows an example of a W2 wood frame building. Um, there's two distinguishing features. Um, one is the wood siding and the other is the curved or double pitched roof. So the wood siding is generally an indication that the building is constructed with wood framing. And that curved roof indicates roof trusses that are spanning between the two sidewalls of the building, sort of in the short direction of the building. Um, this type of roof truss is provided to allow for large open spaces on the inside of the building. So if we, if we thought we might have lots of um, walls on the inside, we wouldn't need these long span trusses. Um, usually these W2 buildings are rectangular um, and the main vulnerability is the shear walls in the short direction. So we have, we probably have long shear walls in the long direction and then in the short direction, we don't have much wall. And then if we add in a lot of openings, um, they end up being very weak in that direction. So let's get to steel buildings. So we have five different types of steel buildings. The first type is the steel moment frame. Um, and this is building type S1. Steel rectangular moment frame buildings often are called moment frames. They have vertical columns and horizontal girdle, girders um, made from steel H-shaped sections or I-beams. The floors deliver the weight of the building contents to the beams and girders. And the floors can be constructed with concrete slab or sometimes wood floors or metal deck, um, just bare metal deck at the roof. And the girders and columns support the full weight of the building and provide the, the seismic force resistance system. So we have an image here that shows um, a steel moment frame building. Um, and you can see steel beams and columns around the perimeter of the building. And this forms both the gravity frame and the lateral frame. Um, the way that this becomes a moment frame is that the girders and columns are rigidly connected together, um, usually by welding the top and bottom of the girders to the columns. So this image shows um, a girder or beam connected to vertical columns. So the vertical column is an I-beam, and then the girder is also an I-beam, and they are welded together at the top and bottom of the girder, and then usually the web of the beam. So the, if you're thinking of an eye, like the, the vertical part of it, that's the web of the beam. And that gets welded or bolted to the column. And um, this, allows, um, this allows us to transfer vertical shear from the girder to the column. So, um, due to gravity loading. And then those connections of the top and bottom of the beam allow us to, to um, transfer horizontal earthquake forces um, to the column through bending of the columns and the girders. So this photo shows an example of a steel moment frame building, but it's a pretty unusual one in that the steel girders and columns on the exterior of the building are visible. Usually we have our steel members encased in fireproofing material. Um, because of the fireproofing, the steel columns typically need architectural finishes around them to improve their appearance. And the steel beams and girders are usually um, hidden from view by suspended ceilings. So if you have an interior column and you can tap on it, um, that might give you an indication whether it's solid concrete or um, gypboard enclosing a steel column. And if access to the building is possible um, and you can look above a suspended ceiling, you might be able to see the I-shaped steel framing. Um, if you can look at a basement or in like a mechanical room that doesn't have any finishes, that's also a great place to be able to see the steel. 
<laughs> so let's look at the performance of this building type. Um, prior to the 1994 North earthquake, steel moment frame buildings were considered to have really great seismic resistance. Um, but after that earthquake, engineers went into the buildings and, and did surveys and found damage to the welded flange connections. So recall that the moment frame gets its strength and stiffness from the welded connection of the beam to the column. And we found fractures, premature fractures of the bottom flange of the girder to the column connections. So on the left side of this um, slide, there's a photo showing the bottom flange connection to the column and that connection has fractured. And when it fractures, remember ductile versus brittle behavior, that is a very brittle performance and we could lose the full capacity of that um, connection right there with a fracture. Um, another place where we found fractured welds were at the base plate. So on the right, we see a four inch thick base plate. I mean, four, that's really big. Um, and there's a crack all the way down it. Um, this photo was from the library at Cal State Northridge, um, which was damaged during the 1994 Northridge earthquake. Um, so after a lot of research on these um, moment frame issues, engineers concluded that a variety of factors contributed to these sudden failures, including poor weld quality, weld material that didn't have sufficient toughness, and joint details that created excessive stresses on the welds. So um, there were a whole bunch of reports and recommendations and research um, FEMA 350, FEMA 351, FEMA 352 and 53. Um, and the results of these studies were considered um, and new codes were developed. So for steel moment frames after 1994, that is your benchmark year for steel moment frames because after the 1994 earthquake, um, there were major improvements to how the um, steel moment frames are sized and designed and detailed and constructed. So the next type of steel frame is the steel braced frame. Um, this uses diagonal braces as the primary seismic force resisting elements. So this slide shows a steel frame and in red are the braces. And just like the steel moment frame, we carry our gravity forces through beat, through um, steel columns and girders, um, but now we introduce braces um, and they may or may not be visible during your sidewalk screening. Um, the columns in the beams are generally gonna be smaller shapes than you would expect in a moment frame. Um, and the braces, if they're not covered up, um, well, if they're obvious, then you know right away that you have an S2 building. So this slide shows some of the typical configurations of bracing that can be used. Um, in the upper left hand, we see single diagonals. And then to the right, there's double diagonals. Um, double diagonal braces typically um, have braces in both directions. And so when the building goes one way, um, the braces are, half the braces are in tension and then you go the other way and the other half are in tension. And the braces are not designed to ever be in compression. Um, chevron braces are shown in the bottom left corner, and these are like upside down V, or you can have an inverted chevron where you have a right side up V, um, and this causes force concentrations at the, at the middle of the girder, um, but if it's designed right, it can have great performance also. And then on the right, bottom right, we have eccentric brace frames. So here the diagonal braces are intentionally oriented so that the brace does not meet at the girder to column joint. It meets a little bit away from the column. And we get, um, we get really um, special stresses induced in the beam at this location where it has to like sort of span between the column and the brace connection. And that is helpful because we can design that portion of the beam to be ductile um, and to take exactly the size force that we want. And then after that, it will be a ductile um, system. Um, so that's, that's a different type of, of brace frame. But the, um, the FEMA P154 considers all these 
braced frames similarly. So here's a photo of a steel frame, um, steel braced frame under construction. So before we put all that exterior cladding on it and we can feel it, see the steel braces really well. Um, the braces are usually steel. Um, they could be tubes or I-beams or angles. Um, and these braces are designed to take both tension and compression forces. The diagonal braces are often hidden behind the architectural finishes. Um, but sometimes in newer construction, um, architects have intentionally left these visible um, to provide like some level of assurance to the occupants that there's um, lateral strength to the building. And they look cool. Um, so steel braces can experience ductile performance or brittle performance. Um, on the left side, we see the eccentric brace frame connection that we talked about before, where we have the braces coming in, um, not at a single work point, but sort of separate from each other, inducing um, loads in one section of the beam. And that section of the beam is called the link, and it can, it can yield ductally. On the left, oh, sorry, on the right, um, we have a brace coming into what's called the gusset plate, the little connector that's welded to your beam and column. And then the brace itself gets bolted to that. And when the bolt fails, um, then we get a brittle failure. So um, it's also possible to have um, a ductile failure in this kind of bracing system. If the brace were to yield before the um, connection of the brace, so in newer codes, um, we have to design the connection of the brace to the column for much higher loads than we designed the brace for so that the brace will yield first and we'll have that sort of like soft paper clip ductile failure that we want rather than the connection failing and us losing all strength. So the photo on the left was from a 22 story building that was damaged in, um, the Christchurch earthquake in 2011. And the photo on the right um, was from the 2011 um, Great Sunday earthquake. A unique type of steel building is the S3, the light metal building. So these structures are typically single story, very utilitarian buildings with different seismic force resisting systems in each direction. We're gonna have steel moment frames um, with sloping roof beams across the transverse direction, so the short direction of the building, and then tension only diagonal braces along the length of the building. And the roof sheathing might just be like corrugated aluminum panels, very light materials. Um, the walls are usually steel or aluminum corrugated panels, um, and we get steel rod X bracing between the columns. And the image on the, the image we see here shows those moment frames um, sort of in yellow. And because they're, this roof is sloped, we get some interesting um, connections from the beam to the column. It's a little different than the moment frame connections we saw when we were looking at building type S1. But functionally, it's the same. The, the um, lateral strength comes from the stiffness of that beam to column connection. Here we have a photo of the interior of a typical light metal building. So we can see the transverse um, moment frames resisting loads in the transverse direction. And then lateral loads in the longitudinal direction are resisted by those diagonal rod braces. Um, the, the rod braces in the, in the longitudinal direction are not nearly as stiff as the moment frames. And so sometimes we get a lot of torsional irregularities in these buildings, but these buildings score really high because um, if we recall that force equals mass times acceleration, um, for a given level of force, for a given level of acceleration or ground shaking from the earthquake, um, the loads on our building are gonna be dependent on how heavy our building is. And these are really, light buildings. Um, so there's seldom collapse of these buildings um, and um, seldom a life safety threat to occupants of these buildings. 
Um, but one thing that can be a problem is if you have like really heavy shelving up against the walls, you know, that shelving might have its own um, seismic forces and then load the building and we can have um, lateral loads being imposed on our building that could cause a column to collapse. So this slide shows the interior of a damaged light metal building. Um, we can see the tie rod bracing in one direction. It was stretched so that after the shaking ended, it was, it was longer than it was originally. And now it's just sort of sagging. Um, and then the other half of the X has fractured and is now just on the ground. Um, we get a little bit of like just the tiniest little bit of lateral strength from that sheathing on the outside. Um, and if our building's light enough, you know, even if we lost all our rod bracing, the building's still standing up because it has just that littlest bit of residual strength left. Um, building type S4 are steel frames with concrete shear walls. So again, similar to S1 and S2, we have steel columns and steel beams that support the vertical load of the building. But now we get lateral um, resistance from concrete shear walls. Um, so this image shows um, a typical S4 building. We see the grid layout of the beams and the columns. And then we can see um, exterior walls in blue. Um, these concrete walls are providing the lateral system. And they're often at the interior shaft. So if you can see in this photo, we see the shaft up through the middle of the building. Um, if that shaft is the main portion of the concrete shear wall system, and if it's eccentric to the center of the building, then we might have some torsion in the building plan, um, which can be dis damaging um, to the building. Um, here's an example of an S4 building, which is kind of deceiving because it'd be pretty hard to tell that this is an S4 building just from looking at it. Um, here we have shear walls located on the interior of the building where we can't see them from a sidewalk survey. So it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be unusual for a screener to think this might be an S1 type building or even a precast building. Um, but um, here we have an S4 building and if we can have a review of the um, building drawings, that would be really helpful in correctly identifying this building, or if we can do an interior survey. Um, here's, here's a photograph of the interior of an S4 building after an earthquake, and here we see some of the characteristic performance. So um, here we had concrete shear walls at the interior shaft, like at the elevator. And um, because the concrete shear walls are so much stiffer than the steel frame, the force gets con concentrated at the shear walls and we see um, cracking of the shear walls. And Mike in module seven is gonna talk a lot about concrete and how it performs. Um, but this is really common to see cracking sort of at the base of the shear wall. Um, and then we end up seeing that exposed rebar inside. And because, you know, shafts need to have entrances for elevators, door openings for elevators and stairs, um, we end up with these smaller piers and we get a lot of concentrated damage. Um, the nice thing about an S4 type building is that once you lose a lot of the rigidity in your concrete, as it gets damaged, you have that steel frame as the backup. And that's going to do a lot to prevent collapse of this type of building. So the final steel building type is building type S5. Um, these are steel frame buildings. Again, we have steel frames, steel girders, and columns supporting the um, vertical loads in the building. But now, instead of a moment frame or a brace frame or concrete walls, we have URM in the fill walls. Um, Usually the masonry is multiple um, layers of brick, um, although um, concrete block masonry can also be used. Um, this type of construction is generally found in older buildings um, from the first half of the 1900s. Um, the masonry is usually on the out 
side exterior walls. Um, and this provides the main seismic force resistance for the building. So this image shows the steel frame and the, the floors in gray. And then in yellow, we see those exterior um, masonry walls. Um, there's also interior partitions um, that could be built with masonry or hollow clay tile, um, neither of which provide a lot of resilience. <laughs> Um, so let's see. So this slide shows a schematic, asymmetric diagram of a typical construction of steel frame buildings with URM info. So we see the floor can either be wood framing, sometimes it's concrete um, with steel beams. And the steel beams are running along the exterior of the building and they're not in line with the columns. So you see the column is, is inboard of the steel frame where the steel beam is sort of built into the brick and the brick wraps around it. Um, there might be a ledger plate that supports the um, flooring to the wall. And this ledger plate, this connection of the floor to the wall is often vulnerable in earthquake loads. So, this slide shows an example of a steel frame building with masonry infill. Um, this building has an exterior of masonry and then on top of the masonry is really beautiful sand, sandstone. Um, the, the layers of brick masonry are used as backing for the sandstone. And although the sandstone is primarily for aesthetic purposes, it's so heavy and stiff that it attracts its own like lateral load. Um, and so it becomes part of the lateral resisting system of the building. Um, the age of a building can be a good indicator of the possibility that it might be a S5 building type with unreinforced masonry infill. Uh, these buildings are generally mid-rise to high-rise buildings constructed in the early 1900s. Um, buildings that are newer that look like they're brick um, on the exterior might just be a brick veneer. And actually it's a steel frame with brick veneer that's really acting as cladding rather than infill. And a good indication that is just cladding and not part of the lateral system is if you can see um, horizontal joints that are filled with, with uh, flexible caulking. Um, showing that the building was designed to allow it to move without imposing a lot of forces on the masonry. And the, the performance of this building type is really similar to unreinforced masonry buildings. Um, so that will be discussed in the next module. Um, and then the final uh, building type that we're gonna talk about right now is manufactured housing, MH. Um, this building type was added to the third edition of FEMA P-154. Um, manufactured housing or mobile homes, both of them start with MH, are often um, used as housing or portable classrooms. These are buildings that are built in a factory and transported to the site. And once they get to the site, they sit on concrete block or steel stands or cripple walls. They're elevate, elevated above grade you know, a couple feet usually. Um, here we see a photograph of manufactured housing and you can see the stairs up to the front door. That's an indication that it's elevated up off the ground. And usually there's a skirt that runs all the way around the perimeter. Um, but if you were to see inside that skirt, you would see, um, you would see it standing on some supports. And um, that is just, very similar to the performance of cripple walls in W1s. So um, if it's unanchored, if there's not special bracing from that first floor down to the ground, then we can get failure similar to W1. So here's a photograph of a mobile home um, that slid off its foundation um, in an earthquake. And um, if there's gas lines that are coming up into the home, um, those can be sheared off and then we lose, um, we, use, we lose the utility, but also there's fire hazard from that. 
can also be really difficult to exit these buildings after an earthquake. So that, that's a life safety concern. Um, but the superstructure of the MH building type rarely collapses, um, similar to, to the wood um, W1 building type. All right, so we have a quiz now. What type of failure is associated with light wood frame, multifamily, multi-story, these are W1A buildings? Do we expect failure of infill walls, soft story collapse, cracked welds, or cripple wall failures? And if you want to take a moment to pause your video, you can do that. Okay, so Gigi, do you have thoughts on what type of failure is associated with W1A buildings? So I think it's a soft story collapse. I think that's correct. Because um, usually these W1A buildings are built above garages or, or just tech under parking. And so we often have that really soft first story. Um, and it's a real vulnerability. Okay, are there any questions? So how safe are wood frame homes um, to strong earthquake shaking? So our wood frame homes are actually really some of the safest places to be in an earthquake. Um, we might have damage of those cripple walls. We might even drop our house three or four feet when the cripple wall collapses. But the upper portion of the structure, the structure, the part where we're occupying and living, um, that's really not as vulnerable to damage. And so it's a pretty safe place to be. Um, I do want to say that often our homes, these single, these single family homes have chimneys. And if the chimneys are not braced, they can be a falling hazard. And they're so big and so heavy, they can fall through the roof into occupied spaces and, and be quite dangerous. Great. Um, and then the next question is, how would you score a building with multiple building types? Right. So we might have, um, you know, some of our W1A buildings, those sort of tuck unders, if you look more closely at it, it might be two stories of wood framing over a concrete podium. Um, so that could be that could be a concrete shear wall or a wood building. I mean, in fact, it's both. Um, and so um, there are guidelines in FEMA P154 for which combinations of buildings we can and cannot capture um, with the RVS screening procedure. And um, in some cases, we can, we can score the building for both building types and then take the lowest score and use that. Um, I think in the case where we have um, one building type on top of another building type, we don't use the RBS procedure. We just need to do a more detailed evaluation. But if we had a case where we have um, concrete shear walls in one direction and concrete moment frame in another direction, we could score for both and take the lowest score. On the next module, Mike will take you through concrete and masonry FEMA building types. This concludes training module six, um, wood and steel FEMA building types. See you in the next one.